The Palladium Ballroom, a legendary, world-famous Latin dance hall, was known as the home of the mambo and the cha-cha. From the time the Palladium opened its doors in 1948, it exploded onto the New York music scene. The Palladium Ballroom was one of the most unique ballrooms that ever existed. It was uh, located on 53rd Street in Broadway. Uh, the location was extremely important because a block on the same side of the, of, the, of the sidewalk, but a block further down was the Birdland, which was the jazz uh, uh, home of jazz. And right around the corner on 52nd Street, you had approximately 40 jazz clubs going down to 5th Avenue from Broadway, 7th Avenue, 6th Avenue. It was quite extraordinary. The Palladium was amazing. It had a narrow entrance, long stairways, but for the kind of people that came there and the kind, and the kind of band that was playing, they needed a bigger place. You walk up those stairs, and the sound system in the Palladium was like no place I've ever heard. The sound system picked up the Maracas de Tito Rodriguez, La Paila de Tito Puente. The sound system was unique. And uh, to get in, 75 cents. Mambo had just broken in 19, the late 1944, and, and uh, it wasn't quite into the American public, you know? The boss, the owner, he says, I gotta get people in here. This place is costing me a fortune. I'm on 53rd and Broadway. The rent is high, everything is right, the insurance. So he said, I gotta get that door. I need so much money every day and I gotta get this place, I gotta put it on the map. Inside of two years, the place was rocking. Cuban band leader Machito and his band, the Afro-Cubans, performed regularly at the Palladium. A visionary musician, Machito was among the first to fuse Afro-Cuban rhythms with jazz improv. Machito uh, was like an incredible uh, force, you know, in, the, in that time because, you know, there was no such thing as that, you know, this, this hybrid. I had gotten so fused into what I listened upstairs at the Palladium and what I listened downstairs at Berlin. And then I've, I discovered that Machito had a combination of both. Machito's band turned out to be a band like Count Basie and Duke Ellington. It was a school. When that band went to Palladium, everybody looked. And everybody started to tune into this Latin thing. In the 1950s, Puerto Rican band leaders Tito Rodriguez and Tito Puente regularly packed the house at the Palladium, each with their own unique style and approach. Their orchestras helped bring Afro-Cuban and Caribbean sounds like mambo, son, and cha-cha-cha to mainstream audiences. Tito Rodriguez was a great singer, incredible. You know, he, he was a, uh, a raw model, and um, a lot of singers came from Tito Rodriguez style, and he knew what he was doing. He was very meticulous. So that comes out in the music. It's very polished, clean, and you know, happening. He was very good looking, had beautiful hair, had a gorgeous voice, you know, and he sang everything, salsa, bolero, you name it. He knew how to sing in such a way. All great singers have that, Sinatra, Perry Como, Bing Crosby, he sing with the rhythm. Sing between, sing between the beats. Let, let the thing rock. Tito Puente was, you know, like he, he's the one that that brought the, the rhythm section up front in front of the band. Before that, the rhythm section would be in the back of the band. You know, even the Cuban bands used to have the rhythm section in the back of the band. Mm 
man, he used to take those drum solos. He'd be playing with those drum solos. And when he, he put down the sticks and start playing with his hands on the, on the timbales like bongos. The people were going crazy. And then he'd have the trumpets there. And they would, they would be playing. They were there and doing with the, you know, wow, wow, wow. Oh, what a group. But Tito was on his vibes. Sounded great. Tito was, as far as Latin music, even the jazz players told me much later that Tito was, in their language, he was a bitch on vibes. The Palladium was known not only for its music, but for the exceptionally high quality of its dancers whose innovation was fueled by weekly dance competitions. Every crowd that came were great dancers. It was one-on-one -on -one between the orchestra and the dancer. It, the only way you could hold a job at the Palladium Ballroom if you played there was if you had the acknowledgement and the okay of the dancers. And if you knocked out those dancers, you were in. You didn't play well, you had a problem. They let you know immediately. There was one corner where if you weren't a good dancer, you could not get in that corner because they threw you out. <laughs> so in the mambo contest, you'd have like dancers like Augie and Margot, uh, Cuban Pete and Millie, and these people were spectacular. I mean, you, you, just, you had to watch them. Wednesdays was mostly an American crowd, a Jewish crowd, you know, that, that loved dancing. And that's the night that you had the mambo show and the amateur hour. They put numbers on the back, you know, and they would dance and they would win a cash prize. Actors from uh, Hollywood used to come up to the Palladium and just sit on the side there and just observe. It was a show. Marlon Brando would come by, for example, Kim Novak. You know, because the Mamba was so popular in those years, this is a, running the whole gamut of the 50s. <laughs> A true rivalry, played out nightly on the Palladium stage, developed between Tito Puente and Tito Rodriguez. This competition thrilled audiences and energized the Tito's musical creativity. There's a lot of talk, uh, you know, one of the big things is the rivalry between Tito Puente and Tito Rodriguez. Uh, first of all, we should say that they were also, prior to their having their own musical organizations, were members of the same band. Uh, Tito Puente was a timbal player with Jose Curbelo's band, and Tito Rodriguez was the singer. So they did work together for a while. And then they soon made their own conjuntos and eventually evolved from those conjuntos into big bands. There was strong competition between the two. They really did everything they could to outplay each other. They got to a point that they had to put like the two Titos instead of putting Tito Puente and Tito Rodriguez, and then eventually Tito Puente would have top billing on the one side of the street, and on the uptown side of the street was Tito Rodriguez. And that was a mambo battle, and the, the Tito Puente would come on after Rodriguez got off, and Tito would say, if I hear one guy crack a note, he's, he's out of here. He said, if you hear what they just play, you guys better be on your toes. You know, they said, Frankie, I want rhythm, I want power. I'm telling you that, dance hall, you could feel the split coming down the middle. You had the Tito Rodriguez faction on this side and the Tito Puente faction on the other. <laughs> the people were, really got their money's worth. But I'm telling you, the both bands were cooking. The people, ah, the Tito Puente, and then the, the Tito Rodriguez, and the bands were cooking, the, the brass was going. We hired another trumpet player to have four trumpets. Tito Rodriguez came with three, but Tito Puente said, I'm coming with four. He said, I'm, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break balls today. I'm coming with four. The benefit of the rivalry was great music uh, when they both played together. They were recording every few months. They would go into the studio and come out with four new mambos. And then Tito Rodriguez would come out with four mambos. And then Tito Puente would come out with four more. It was like a, a constant, uh, uh, like the, the competition made for great music. <laughs> Although the Palladium was originally opened as an Anglos-only dance hall, the club soon opened its doors to blacks, Puerto Ricans, and Cubans, creating a truly integrated audience. At the Palladium, the ability to dance, not class or color, became the social currency. You had people of 
all colors and races come and do the mambo. The Palladium was the United Nations of New York City. The Negroes were over there. The Cubans, they used to sit in that particular corner, and over there were the Jews. And the Jews would get up and dance. <laughs> For some reason, the blacks and the Jews always got along, and I have a feeling that it was because of the mambo. By the early 1960s, with the rising popularity of rock music, the Palladium era began to fade. The club closed its doors for the last time in 1966. The Palladium was uh, this centerpiece of the Latin New York scene up till the 60s, up till it closed. They called it the House of the Mambo, and, and rightly so. Uh, I don't think that another club has ever filled that vacuum. When it was closed, it broke my heart. Another, another place opened, and another place opened, and another place opened, but it was never the same. And it hasn't been the same ever since. <laughs> 